everyone's time. I want to thank everyone who is joining us today. My name is Catherine Dougal and I'm the Development and Engagement Specialist here at Bridge Michigan. Today we'll be discussing Michigan's caregiving crisis and this, is, this event is a part of Bridge Michigan's monthly lunch break series where we discuss important issues to Michigan residents. And today this event is in partnership with the New York and Michigan Solutions Journalism Collaborative. If you're not familiar with Bridge, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan statewide news organization, and you can read our coverage every day for free online at bridgemi.com. The New York and Michigan Solutions Journalism Collaborative is a group of news, academic, and community organizations pooling time, talent, and resources to cover chronic problems with a solutions lens. <laughs> you can learn more and read the reporting at nymisojo.com, and we're going to drop both those links in the chat for everyone. I want to thank our Bridge members who are with us today and who help support our work. If you're not already a member and would like to become one, you can do so anytime on our website. Our membership director, Amber DeLynn, is going to drop a link for that in the chat as well. We also just want to announce that we are um, introducing a new way to, for businesses and nonprofits to support the work that we do at Bridge. This month, we are launching our business and nonprofit memberships, Bridge Builders. If your organization or someone you know might be interested in sponsoring our newsletter or one of our virtual events, or joining Bridge Builders, reach out to Trish DeWald and we're going to put her information in the chat for you. The schedule for today's discussion is that we'll begin with a conversation between Bridge Michigan reporter Ted Roloffs and our special guests. We will then open the discussion to reader questions for our panelists. Throughout this discussion, you can enter your questions into the chat function window at any time. If you're calling in today, you can email your questions to us at membership at bridgemi.com. Just so you know, we are recording this discussion and we'll be posting it in Bridge, Michigan tomorrow. Now to introduce our exciting panelists we have joining us. First, we have Dr. Paula Duran. Paula is the Director of Universal Dementia Caregivers. Universal Dementia Caregivers prepare, pre prepares caregivers with strategies to engage the hearts and spirits of those living with dementia and needs-based communities while caring for the caregiver. Currently, UDC offers individual and family coaching, training, support groups, lunch and learns, and caregiving job aids. Prior to establishing UDC, Paula led Dern and Associates Incorporated Human Resources Consulting Team for over 25 years. She also served as a staff psychologist and instructor at Illinois State University. Paula is a graduate of Southern Illinois University and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, a Leadership Detroit graduate, and UDC was recently featured, featured in a caregiving documentary sponsored by the Ralph Wilson Foundation. We are also joined today by Dr. Claire Luz. Claire is the Associate Professor of Family and Community Medicine at MSU College of Osteopathic Medicine and is the founding director of both MSU Age Live and Impart Alliance. She is also a gerontologist whose research focuses on quality of life for vulnerable older adults, long-term healthcare services, particularly the elder care workforce shortage and the intersection of aging health and the arts. Dr. Luz co-chairs both the statewide MDHHS Direct Care Workers Advisory Committee and the statewide Michigan Direct Care Workers Coalition. Dr. Luz has served on the Michigan Long-Term Supports and Services Advisory Commission, the Michigan Society of Gerontology Board, and the National Quality Forum's Home and Community-Based Care Committee. Last but not least, we are joined today by Christine Van Landingham. Christine is the Chief Operating Officer for Region 4 Area on Aging in St. Joseph, Michigan, and has 19 years in the field of aging. Through strategic partnerships, Van Landingham develops and expands coordinated healthcare and community-based service initiatives and works with public health, academia, policymakers, community planners, and community coalitions to shape public policy and service systems to meet the needs of seniors, younger persons with disabilities, and caregivers. Van Landingham is responsible for overseeing the development of a coordinated system of services in Southwest Michigan to allow older adults to live with dignity and independence in the setting of their choice and inspiring, inspiring others to join in that work. Van Landingham is a member of the Spectrum Health Board of Directors board chair of Lakeland Hospital Water Valet and PACE of Southwest Michigan board member. Now I'll pass it over to Ted to get us started. Thanks, that was a great introduction. 
And before I get started on the questions, I want to just briefly frame this issue so we kind of know where we're coming from and why this is such an important issue for Michigan. I think we all know that most people want to stay in their homes as they age. That only makes sense. It's where we feel safest and secure. But that could be more and more difficult over the coming years and decades. Michigan's getting older. The number of people aged 75 and older will grow by 500,000 over the next 20 years. That age group will go from about 7% of the population to 12% by 2040. So we need people to look after these folks. But Michigan already suffers from a gap of paid home care workers. Right now it's about 34,000. That shortage could be as high as 200,000 by 2026. The turnover rate in this workforce is about 80%. There's also a big problem for the unpaid family caregivers. Right now, about 1.3 million Michigan residents are providing unpaid care to family members. But that pool is shrinking. As national projections forecast, the available family caregivers will fall from seven relatives per senior to four by 2030. That can make it even harder for the elderly to stay in their homes. And there's a toll on unpaid family caregivers. They suffer from higher rates of depression and anxiety. Many quit jobs or retire early so they can provide unpaid care. They spend an average of about $7,000 a year out of their own pocket to look after their loved ones. So that's what Michigan is up against. I'd like to start off by turning to Christine. And I wonder, Christine, if you could, basics, could you walk us through the kind of care that paid caregivers give to people? Certainly. So the, the direct care workers, the paid workers that help people stay in their home, um, provide a wide range of services. And it really is, there's no typical day. So they might be doing things like uh, cooking, laundry, shopping, some of those uh, activities of daily living that just are hard for some older folks or people with disabilities to accomplish on their own. Then it also ranges up to some significant personal care. So it might be um, repositioning someone in bed. It might be transitioning someone, toileting them, um, helping them with showers, bathing, everything that you can think of in terms of if you were not able to manage your own um, activities of daily living, be able to live alone, um, that these personal care aides come in, these direct care workers and do for folks. So it uh, can be, um, incredibly emotionally taxing as well as physically taxing. And a typical day might be someone might work in um, one client's home for eight hours in a day, or they might spend time traveling around town and helping three to four, maybe five people in a day's time, all with different care plans, um, just helping meet their person-centered needs. At some points, um, depending on the circumstance, depending on the individual in their home, can this work be physically difficult or even dangerous? It can absolutely be physically difficult. And um, so that often we're having um, folks have to trans transfer someone from a chair to a bed or to, to, a, um, to a commode. And the person, your client might weigh significantly more than you. So learning how to transfer someone, there are clients who use Hoyer lifts so to use the machinery and, and manage that. So it's a physically demanding job often. And, and certainly when we talk about um, exposure to, to disease or, or chronic uh, or, or um, illnesses, the flu and the like, or the pandemic, there certainly is a, a, a safety risk on that side as well. What's the situation like in your part of Michigan as far as the need for paid caregivers and the supply that's available? So um, before the pandemic, uh, there was already a shortage of direct care workers in Southwest Michigan. In particular, some areas of the community were hard to find workers just based on geography, but the shortage was already there in terms of um, not being able to staff some cases or may maybe understaffing them because there wasn't a worker to, to, to um, provide that care or um, workers who were already working a really long and hard day were covering shifts so that we made sure that people had the care that they need. With the pandemic, that shortage has accelerated vastly. Uh, 
individuals, um, perhaps direct care workers perhaps didn't have childcare, their kids weren't in school, so they had to leave the workforce. So we've seen an incredible spike in, uh, in loss of caregivers for home care. But I will say this, the crisis goes beyond just for those who wanna re remain in home. Direct care workers also, these paid caregivers, also work in skilled nursing facilities, assisted livings, et cetera. And facilities in our region, from skilled nursing facilities to hospice care and, and assisted livings, have had to shrink their capacity because they don't have the workforce to provide the care. So it cuts across care settings. Not much of, of this is really about um, basic economics. The work is hard, as you, I think you just explained to us, yeah. but the pay is not good at all. And I think as I've written in, in some of the reporting, you can make as much, if not more, in the, in the food service industry, retail sectors. So yeah, how much of, of that is at the root of this problem? So I think it's a, it is a root of the problem. I don't think it's the only cause, but it is, an, is, it is one root of the problem. A direct care worker might make 12 or $13 right now in Southwest Michigan, and um, they could make 16, 18, up to 20 as a fast food worker. So you can see when you're uh, talking about personal risk and safety and um, physical activity, strenuousness, it's, it, has, it takes a calling to stay in this labor force. So with the recent um, increase, a $2.35 increase to the hourly wages of direct care workers that um, Michigan's, um, the last budget um, made, made permanent, that helps, but that's not the only solution. And it really isn't, it still doesn't get people up to even a job wage at McDonald's. So I think that's wage is only one of, this, one of the issues. How much of this is about um, respect for the work that's being done? It's some, something I've encountered in my reporting that, that workers, if nothing else, want to be valued and respected for the work that they do. Yeah, I think um, you, you really hit on the heart of the issue. So it is about valuing this workforce and, and, and financial um, wage is only one way that we uh, communicate value. The other way is that we, we need to lift up this workforce as the honorable career path that it is. Um, it is a high calling. And when you think about entering into someone's life when they're vulnerable, when they're at risk, and you come alongside them to do some very personal assistance, that is um, an opportunity to really pour into someone's life and make an incredible difference. If you think about the impact of these direct care workers, they're allowing, their service allows someone to continue to live at home where they're most comfortable, where they feel most safe, and, and avoid institutionalization. And what greater calling can that be? So we need to lift this up and value the direct care workers as the honorable career that it is. I think you know, it's pretty well established that a lot of people in, the, in direct care work live on the margins of poverty because of the wages are not great. And I know that in your um, agency, if I remember correctly, I think you established a fund, a special fund to help these workers with emergency things that come up in their life. As I recall, it was about $600,000. And I wonder if you could explain that because I think it's important so that people realize just the margins on which some of these workers live. And if we expect them to do this work, how difficult that can be for some individuals. Right, so before the pandemic, even before COVID-19, we recognized, we talked with direct care workers and with home care agencies and talked about what are the barriers. We know wage is one barrier. We're doing what we can to, to make, to support that but they were living on the edge in terms of just um, a, a car battery goes dead or they need a new tire or they're out of cell phone minutes so they can't contact work. Um, just, and then they, and they drop out of the workforce because they can't afford that small car repair. Something under $200 is just beyond their means to accomplish. So we established a fund that um, was, is flexible enough that we can pay for minor car repairs, we can um, get insurance on a car so they can get back to work, maybe uh, provide a battery, cell phone minutes, pay for childcare. So if uh, the child, uh, the regular daycare is not available or their center is closed, we can pay for some childcare. Further, so it's those, it's those one-time emergencies that 
are going to take someone out of the workforce if we don't meet that need. So we're able to do that. We also use this fund to do mentoring. Ted, you talked about this being challenging work, both physically dangerous sometimes and emotionally. There's training for direct care workers when they start this job. But when you go into someone's home and it's a unique caregiving situation that's um, and you're a new direct care worker or relatively new, this fund we've used to pay a more seasoned worker to come right alongside with this newer direct care worker and mentor them through the process until they really establish some um, ownership and some competencies that go beyond the basics that really help them learn how to deal with challenging situations. It's so much more than just how to transfer someone, um, how to do medication reminders, et cetera. So those are a couple of those are a couple of broad categories that we've used. It's both mentoring to make sure that we help folks stay engaged in this workforce and, and meet those emergency needs that uh, would derail their career if we weren't able to do that for them. Well, thanks so much for your time. That was really enlightening and helpful. And now I'd like to turn to uh, Claire and just maybe take a step back. And, and try to get a broader perspective on, on where we stand in this issue in Michigan. Um, could you just maybe in general compare where Michigan stands uh, as far as comparison to the rest of the country, to the other states in support for services for people uh, who want to stay in their homes and maybe what that looks like in the future? Uh, sure. Uh, and first, shout out to Christine and Ted, who did a great job framing this issue and actually mentioned a lot of the points that I was hoping to make, but I'm glad that somebody's making them. Um, because Michigan is really like the rest of the United States in terms of the challenges it faces right now due to a rapidly aging population, as Ted mentioned. In fact, it is aging more uh, faster than most other states. And nationally, by 2030, nearly a quarter of the population is going to be age 65 plus. And these are statistics that have just extraordinarily effect on all of us, both personally and collectively, um, with our parents, our partners, ourselves. And it also affects the economy and housing and transportation and healthcare systems and businesses and so forth. We're very much uh, going through what many of the other states are going through. This demographic shift means that there is a higher prevalence of long-term ter chronic conditions and dementia and a shift to home care because as Ted said, most people do not want to live in a nursing home. Um, and this increased need for long-term supports and services means we need caregivers. Um, about most of the care is still, as it always has been, provided by family caregivers, as much as 80%. Um, but as Ted mentioned, if we are there's a growing shortage of family caregivers. And one of the consequences of that, and this is true across the United States too, is that there's a new phenomena of, of reaching down into younger generations. And about a quarter of the family caregivers are now millennials or younger. And we are actually studying this phenomena right now, trying um, and interviewing and surveying college student caregivers, because a lot of these young people are college students who are struggling to get an education while being a family caregiver. And they need help. Families need help. And when they seek help, it's a, they turn to the paid caregivers that we're talking about today who provide about 80% of the paid care that allows people to stay in their own homes and be as independent as possible. Michigan has wonderful programs, um, a lot going on compared to other states. I hope I have a chance to tell you about a few things um, for its aging citizens and, and people with disabilities, living with disabilities. But unfortunately, Michigan is also like other states in that we have a critical shortage of qualified direct care workers. And <clears throat> Ted mentioned that we need about 35,000 more direct care workers than we have right now. We need 35,000 more right now, like yesterday, actually. And we don't want just warm bodies. I'm assuming everybody agrees. We want people who know what they're doing, who are qualified, who are going to uh, treat their clients with respect and dignity. And as Christine mentioned, COVID has exacerbated the shortage 
as has the steep competition in the private sector service jobs. And like other states, we're facing the same challenge of the fact that most direct care workers are paid for through Medicaid. And there is a Medicaid reimbursement. There's a cap on Medicaid reimbursement rates, which makes it almost impossible to compete with Target or McDonald's wages right now. So um, that, that's a little bit about how we compare. We're, we're really facing the same struggles and for the same reasons, we know why there's a shortage. We know how to address it. We have a lot of strategies on how to address it. Um, and the good news is that Michigan really is uh, working hard. And I'll tell you about a few initiatives in a minute to aggressively tackle this shortage. Maybe just, this is a pretty broad question, but how much of this if from your thinking is about, about dollars, about we need to spend more, we need to pay people better, that sort of thing. And how much of this is about a recognition of how we can better support people, whether they're paid or unpaid, in doing this very important work? And maybe just general education, maybe this ought to occur to all of us, but we're all going to get older. And many of us are going to need help in our home if we want to stay in our home. So shouldn't we, in one way or another, value this more than we do right now? Yeah, ab absolutely, uh, without question. Um, and as Christine said, it really, the, the, the dollars are important, of course. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for the shortage is are the low wages and benefits and the lack of guaranteed hours. Um, and even if we raise, we're able to raise the wages to $20 an hour, if you only have 10 hours a week, you can, still can't make a living wage. So we have to address wages for sure. But as Christine said, wages are not the only issue. Um, there are also other things that we should be doing, including placing more value on this workforce. I, my back gets up when I, I still hear people referring to this work as um, non-skilled or unskilled or low-skilled when it is really anything but that. It requires great skill levels and uh, we need to really start reframing how we even talk about this workforce. Um, but when I, I, I will let you know that one of the things that I'm excited about is that Impart Alliance is, has gone into partnership with PHI, which is a national organization dedicated to raising up the direct care workforce. Their slogan is better jobs or better care through better direct care worker jobs. And um, we have, they have um, received some grant money to work with three states on policy reforms related to direct care workers and in three areas. And they're working with Impart Alliance to, to really carry this out. And one of the uh, policy areas is increased wages and benefits, but the other is really focused on professionalizing this workforce, which has to happen. And by that, I mean establishing some competency standards um, professional standards, ethical standards. For some of the direct care workers, those exist. For certified nursing as assistants, for example, there are federal requirements that they have to go through a certain amount of training, 75 hours worth of training at least. But for the majority of the direct care workers, there are no training requirements that are at the federal level, no competency requirements, no credentials. Um, it's really hard to, to fight to raise the value and the perception and the wages of these workers when they're lacking these things. So professionalizing the workforce is really important, establishing competency and quality standards, developing a model curricula program that maps to those standards, creating some career pathways, providing credentials. Our society is so credential oriented and they really need that to to be able to get ahead and compete. Um, and there are a number of ways to do that. And they're all connected. That's what I keep preaching with all of the work we're doing at the state level is these are all connected. You can't have like raise the wages of a few workers over here um, or train a few workers over there. You know, you can have the best trained workforce in the world. It doesn't make any difference if they're still making $11, $12 an hour or they don't have a car or they can't afford gas to put in the car. These things are all connected and we have to work on all of them simultaneously. Let me ask you this, um, and maybe it's already 
evident in, in what we've talked about, but let's do a what if. What if we don't really do anything in Michigan, do anything different than what we're doing right now? What do things look like 20 or 30 years from right now? And what are the repercussions if we do nothing? Yeah, that's that's a pretty dismal question there, Ted. Um, because, uh, you know, a colleague and I just wrote a paper on this, as was predicted back in, in 1982. So how many years ago was that? Um, by the Institute of Medicine, when we all saw this coming, we all knew the boomers were getting were coming along here. If nothing is done to avert this path we're on, there will be desperate times for lots of people. Care providers will shutter their doors. It's already happening right now in Michigan. I was on a meeting this morning and somewhat related to the new auto insurance policy reforms, 45 different care providers have shuttered their doors. Um, people are gonna go without care. People are gonna die. Families are gonna try to step in and shoulder the care. But as you pointed out earlier, there are ripple effects, dangerous ripple effects to family caregivers risking their own physical and mental health, their own livelihoods, their own retirement. Businesses are gonna lose productivity because of all of the employees trying to juggle work and family caregiving, which means the economy is gonna take a hit. We have no choice but to do something to address this issue. If I remember correctly, um, you started a program, I think, at a Michigan high school to offer uh, training uh, as a personal care aid as, you know, maybe one possible avenue to helping solve this crisis, which is to prepare, maybe broaden the workforce that, that might be out there. I wonder if you could maybe just walk us through what, uh, what happened at that high school and, and what the experience was. So that was through a grant that I received from the Michigan Health Endowment Fund to uh, develop and test a direct care worker technical training program for high school students. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is because we, we have to increase the number of direct care workers and we have to do so rapidly. Um, and one way to do that is we have to widen, in addition to training, we have to widen the pipeline and tap non-traditional sources of talent for the direct care workforce, like high school students and retirees and people who have been displaced due, the, due to the pandemic. And then we need to give them the tools to do the job well. And with the high school program, it's really win-win. It helps the students, um, it helps the society with this shortage, but it also helps the students uh, prepare for a job that they can get straight out of high school they may stay in it, or they may use it as a stepping stone to other careers in healthcare, or to make some money while they're going to college. I've interviewed a number of direct care workers who worked as a direct care worker while they were going to college. And it develops not only the technical skills, but leadership skills, problem solving skills, confidence, and something for their resume. Um, and a big shout out to Grand Ledge School District that helped us pilot it. And I'm and, and to your question about what happened to us, we had a tremendous program going uh, full swing ahead and, um, and then COVID hit. And our program is all in person in Grand Ledge High School shut down. And we had to struggle to figure out how to get these students through the rest of the program virtually. And, you know, it's difficult to teach somebody how to transfer another person um, from bed to chair or to give them a shower. It's difficult to teach them that virtually. We did, and in the course of this whole thing, several of them graduated and moved on. But we did get a couple of students through the program. It was extremely um, rewarding. And we would like to see this program replicated in other communities. Well, great. Thanks a lot for this discussion. Again, it was enlightening and very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, now I'd like to move along to Paula and, and kind of take a closer look at the unpaid uh, caregiver side of this equation, in large part because of your personal experience with your, with your own parents. Um, I wonder, Paula, if you could just kind of share your experience as you dealt with, as I remember, both of your parents had dementia and you were right there in the front line in the, in the last years of, the, of their lives. And maybe what was that experience 
like for you and what did you learn from it? Paula, you're muted. Thank you very much and Ted for the invitation and to my panelists for being part of this conversation. I cared for mom and dad. Mom had Alzheimer's and dad had vascular dementia. And one of the, and I was doing what I do, you know, just being busy 24 seven, like everyone else does. And what happened was that uh, I started noticing some things in my mom and dad. And it be became so noticeable that you kind of said something has to happen here. And so in caring for them, it was the most challenging, painful experience I've ever had, yet it was the most wonderful gift I could ever be given. So caregiving for me is not just the painful side of it, because the more I learned on how to just simply be present, to not try and fix everything, to not try and make them do what I wanted them to do. And you know, with dementia, they never do what you want them to do. Um, so it's one of those things where I came to really appreciate my role and how important I was to them. And it was humbling, uh, but there was a point, and I'm gonna tell you, there, I thought I was smart. I'm just gonna be honest. I'm a PhD, I'm smart and I'm a psychologist and I know about this stuff. Came to realize that this thing, this disease and this role will move you to your needs. And gaining that appreciation, I realized that caregiving is a calling. Not everybody can be a caregiver. And I think that might be also part of the issue that we see sometimes that Chris and Claire were talking about. This work requires you to have a heart a whole lot bigger for somebody else oftentimes than yourself. Yet the other flip side of that is we care so much sometimes we lose ourselves. So our caregivers are burdened and they're stressed and they're not taking care of themselves, but there's a need for a balance. And so what I learned was the importance of balance, the importance of simply being present, learning that I can't control another adult, but gaining appreciation, I am in partnership with the loved one that I'm supporting. And once I came to those things, there was a peace in my spirit. The more peaceful I am, the nicer they were to me, which was amazing to me because there were some days my mother could really be mean. Um, but I realized it wasn't my mother that was mean, it was this disease that was eating up her brain that was causing her to, to feel that way. And thus she struck out. And once I came really to understand those kinds of things, I became kinder. And as I was kinder, they became kinder to me at the same time. So those are some of my learnings. But it, it, again, and I said it was the most positive and yet the most challenging. It made such a difference in my life. I mean, it slowed me down so much that I came to realize that life was a whole lot more important and loving and caring for someone than the 24 seven uh, rat race I was choosing to be part of at the time. And I, I think as I understand it, maybe largely because of your own experience with your parents, you <clears throat> have done work to try to help other people in the same situation. I know you started these uh, <clears throat> all day boot camp sessions for family caregivers. And yes. I wondered if you could, I, I know we talked about this some time ago, but could you maybe just share some of the experiences that, that you're aware of from talking to these caregivers, just kind of the highs and lows of, of what these people are going through as, the, as they care for their loved ones? Yes, we started Universal Dementia Caregivers and we focus, our byline is we care for the caregiver. We are very clear that there are a whole lot of people caring for our loved ones living with various disease or illnesses yet are really very focused on caregivers. We're starting to see more of that. We're learning more, people are researching it more. So I put this, this I have a full day boot camp, and the boot camp starts with, we care for the caregiver. So we start by ensuring that they have a great experience, that we ensure that they are recognized because there's so little recognition for family caregivers, but caregivers in general, because a lot of caregivers just take on the role because there's no one else to take on the role. And so they, they, we don't give them the recognition. And so we give them, uh, create a community in the room. We create a family. We provide them with wonderful gifts and recognition. And then we teach skills. And then we also allow them a safe space to say, I don't like my parents anymore. 
And people need to feel safe being angry at their parents. Someone contacted us once and says, is it okay that I'm mad at my mother? I said, absolutely, can't stay mad. We need to understand what you're mad about because you're oftentimes mad at someone, they're not doing something that they're not capable of doing. How can you be mad at someone if they're not capable of doing it? But so we get into those kinds of conversations. We celebrate the caregiver. Uh, we understand what Alzheimer's is. We understand our personal reactions. We talk a lot about self-care. Uh, because self-care, the healthier the caregiver, the healthier the person you are supporting. So the kinds of things they bring in, Ted, they range from my mother doesn't remember my name to my daddy thinks I'm his girlfriend. And these are, all, I mean, these are the, the range of issues. And how do you deal with them? So one young woman called and said, my daddy grabbed my part of my body and, and said, what should I do? What should, and she was just so upset. I say, first thing is you got to manage you. The bottom line is self-management. And then you talk about strategies for how you manage those situations. So their experiences range from that. Uh, most of us that are caregivers wished we could heal our parents or our loved ones that we're supporting. Once you come to grips that you can't, but what you can do is you can make the last days the best days. And that was my personal model because uh, I want you to know my mother didn't like me very well. When I was 16, my mother put all of my clothes on the front porch and just told me to get out. So here I am now, the guardian for my mother and my father, which means I had to work through my junk because sometimes caregivers have issues for the for, towards the person they're serving. So I had to release my mother from not what I thought being a good mother. But then when I realized there's no book on being the best mother of the world, our parents are who they are and we give them grace as they gave us grace. So those are, that's some of them, um, the, they range in their emotions. There's some caregivers that have just lost themselves. And one of the things we focus in on is helping them redefine themselves. Cause now I am a caregiver. Oh, no, no, no. You are a whole person, mind, body, spirit, emotional, and social. So we teach that to, so we get them strategies on how you continue to be a real person, quote unquote. And somebody out there saying, how do you have time? There's no time to take care of yourself. There's no time. If you don't make time, you will die before the loved one. And the research already shows that. Many of our caregivers are dying before the ones they're serving as a result of, of the time that they're spending. So those are the kinds of things. So we also will provide for them a real space to talk. And when you're in a room and people actually understand you, what a powerful moment. And they're not judging you and they're allowing you to be honest. And so that's what we try to create in this boot camp setting. And then, you know, afterwards we do, we will also provide support groups online and various other supports. But those are some of the initial things that, that came to mind when you asked that question. Let me ask you this, uh, and I think you've reflected on a lot of this already, but how important is it that people in this situation know that they are not alone? which I think is a very common experience. And a lot of people go into this with zero training, uh, zero knowledge of where to turn. So they're immediately, you know, 10 feet underwater and they're just in it and they don't know what to do. But how important is it that people know that A, they're not alone and that B, there are resources out there to help them? It's very important because part of the challenge is caregivers don't, family caregivers don't call themselves caregivers. Oh, I'm just a daughter who happens to go get the clothes or do this, doing little things. Because it starts with little things. And then before you know it, it's consuming you. And they're still not calling themselves caregivers. I say, okay, never call yourself a caregiver. I don't have a problem with that. But we need to figure out how do we get you to start asking for support and assistance? And you know, there's some families that have been raised, you know, all our stuff stay in the house. And what we found with communities of color, the oftentimes dementia in particular is viewed sometimes thought of as a mental illness. Well, in the, in the African-American community, we hide mental illness, but we're getting better. Hear me, we're getting much better at that. But what we do is it's really important they know they're not alone and it's okay to ask for support and you don't have to get lost in it. But unfortunately, sometimes when they finally ask for support, it doesn't work. And then when it doesn't work, they withdraw and never ask for support again. 
So we need to make sure that the services that people, it's almost like when you go into a facility, no matter who you speak to, they could send you to the right person versus I'm sorry, I'm responsible for this. I'm not responsible for that. Once you do that to a caregiver, you've lost them. Especially family caregivers, they had enough nerve to actually come out. They need to know they're not by themselves. And when you start talking to them and they hear you talk about issues that they're facing, I mean, straight talk about what they're facing, they then realize, okay, I didn't do so bad. There are times they finally say to us in some of our sessions, I'm not really doing a bad job, am I? No, you're not. You're doing a great job. You're doing the best you can. Let's continually know that there are services out there. There are resources available. There's respite support. But in some communities, they don't even know what that word means. What's respite? Well, part of this, I mean, stop calling it respite. How about a timeout? Let's change our language so it fits the team, the groups that we're finding. And I'm hoping the researchers in this conversation are looking for ways to help them better self-identify earlier so they can get resources earlier because they're not caregivers. They're just doing what they do. Um, so back to your question, it's very important that they know others are in the same space, that they're actually understood and that it really is okay if you don't know how to do everything. Because what's funny is somehow you weren't perfect before you became a caregiver, but all of a sudden I'm a caregiver and I now have to be perfect. So I'm one who stresses that. Were you perfect before doing that other job? No. So what, what happened? Well, it becomes more emotional. And so, yes. And in particular with dementia, it's such a hard disease to deal with and for people to understand because you can't put your hand on it. Cancer. Oh, I understand cancer. But this whole thing about dementia is sometimes we think they're clowning. Sometimes we think they're fake. And watch, when so-and-so comes over, they're going to behave differently. And sometimes they do. So helping the caregiver know it's okay, it's safe to actually ask questions, to seek support, and it doesn't diminish your role and it makes you healthier because a healthy caregiver provides healthy care. And one final question, um, how much room for growth do you see in Michigan to provide this kind of support for the unpaid family caregiver? I mean, just how much room for improvement is there in Michigan? Well, this is, I, I'm not, a, I don't have as much knowledge as, as the panelists, but I'm on a statewide committee now. And one of the things we're talking about is how do we get caregivers more support? How do we get them to self-identify? How do we, different things. It is very important that we, first of all, honor this role. And I don't just mean just for family caregivers, for caregivers in general. We need to honor the role because when we talk about service sometimes in, our, in, 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 in this country, Service is not necessarily viewed as honorable. It is such an honorable thing to choose to make the decision that I am going to use my talents to support someone else. That, that is a gift. And we reframe caregiving from caregiving to gift giving. And so we start thinking your gifts are being given, but meanwhile, you're gaining a whole lot of gifts in the process. So I think there's lots of room to quickly better identify who they are, they're in hot, they come in hospitals with our loved ones because we don't know what else to do. Well, maybe there's a way you can get the hospitals to start labeling them and, and sending them support and information earlier. Uh, there's a way that we could recognize pay is essential because family caregivers basically, they're not, they're not really having any income, most of them. So they then like, how do I survive? The things that I was doing for myself, I can no longer do it. Um, so I'm sure there's, there's lots of room. Those are a couple of things for me but also organizations honoring and listening to the caregiver. Too often caregivers go into hospital settings or business settings and they don't talk to the caregiver. And the caregiver knows more about that person than anybody else. If the loved one is capable of speaking and sharing for themselves, it's essential that we do, we hear and honor them first. But the caregiver needs to make sure that their voice is heard because they are the advocate. That way we start honoring their voice hearing their voice. When I, my mother would go to the hospital, I want you all to know, I went on rounds with the doctors. So by the time they got to my mother, I knew exactly what was right. And, and I wanted to talk to you all. So there's no cold. I'm here, deal with me. I am the best advocate for my mother and father that anyone else could be, but I'm open to being part of the team. Ted, you know I can continue talking, so I'm gonna honor and give it back to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we have some time set aside for questions, so I don't know if this is the right time to turn to that, but uh, I guess I'll leave that open.
So I'm wondering, are there questions for our panelists? That I know we've had some reader questions coming through the chat and also through email. Um, we had a number of questions in the chat so far. I know that for our panelists, we did have a question um, regarding direct care workers and vaccination. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has really worked on that, but I saw that we had a question about that early on in the conversation. So I could speak to what we're doing in our region. So um, we're working with our um, direct care worker uh, employers to talk about vaccine access. Early in the pandemic, we made sure that um, the health departments and the health systems um, had uh, the numbers of direct care workers and the agencies for which they worked and we streamlined clinic access so we could get those direct care workers who wanted to be vaccinated and we worked on education and got them seamless access to clinics because sometimes that was a barrier just um, in terms of the rollout and are they eligible. Um, certainly there was some confusion around that so we made sure they had access and education. We work with our um, uh, the employers in our region to understand where the vaccine vaccination rates are and where the barriers are. Is it transportation? Let's tap that fund so that we can get get them to the clinic, et cetera. So um, I think it's um, it's about information, it's about education, and it's about access. Making sure that we understand the barriers, we honor, we listen to their questions, and we get them good information and um, don't devalue their questions and really making sure that they're they have access to getting all their questions answered and then that logistics are not a barrier so that's what we're doing in our region yeah, i'm just looking here through some of the questions that have come in um ted can i just say something about the vaccine hesitancy yeah go ahead so at the state level, you know, we have some, as I mentioned earlier, some great initiatives happening at the state level. About 18 months ago, um, Dr. Alexis Travis, who was that, at that point in time, the director of MDHHS Aging and Adult Services, initiated a statewide direct care workforce advisory committee, which I co-chair, and um, it's going strong. We have three very active work groups. One of them is around professionalizing this workforce. I meant I talked a little bit about that earlier, but one of them is around PPE and vaccinations. And, uh, you know, the general concern is that um, I agree, Christine has to uh, has a good program going there. You have to make it access as accessible as possible and get out good, solid information about it. But nevertheless, there are direct care workers who are vaccine hesitant. And how do you, why is that? How do you reach them? Those are some of the questions we're wrestling with. And it's not just direct care workers. I mean, there are people who are vaccine hesitant, other healthcare workers, police officers, you know, people that you would think, you know, are there to protect the people and help people stay healthy. You wonder why this hesitancy exists. So we're trying to understand that and figure out uh, good messaging to um, address the people that are hesitant to get a vaccine in the first place and find out, like Christine said, is it a transportation is the issue? Is it an access issue? But if it is just straight up hesitancy, how, how do we handle that? Just another question. I imagine this is probably uh, in a lot of people's minds as they think about caring for a loved one. This question is just simply any tips on planning for my mom's care in advance of a crisis moment? Anybody who wants to jump in on that, feel free. So yeah, I'd like to jump in on that. I think what wisdom you have right now to be thinking about this in advance of a crisis moment. It's most likely a crisis moment is coming. So it, it, I, it starts with getting yourself educated. I would encourage you to reach out to your local area agency on aging. Um, their information and access services can, can sit down with you, talk about what your current situation is, what the goals of your mom, your parents are, and what your current situation is, and plan for what services might um, might be available in as, as you move through um, 
the journey. We talk about, someone asked about how do you help people identify as a caregiver? We talk about being a, it being a journey with your aging parents and that makes sense to folks. And as they get into it, they realize, oh, I probably am a care partner or a caregiver, but I'd encourage you to reach out to your area agency on aging and find out about what services are available. How do I make a plan? Make sure that advanced directives are in place so that you've got the power of attorney or other, or that the, your parents have named that. So decisions can be made, um, should they not be able to, but it starts with information and conversation and the AAA is a great place to start. I have a two. I'm sorry, Claire, go ahead. Well, I would just like to add that it's really important too to talk with the family member, the person that you're concerned about um, and find out what their wishes are and find out, you know, ask, there's some really good books out there um, on how to get these conversations started. These are hard conversations to have, but it's important to have them. It's important to have them now before a crisis exists and ask, you know, not just do you want, um, to be resuscitated or do you want life-sustaining procedures but also you know what's important to you in life what do you value what would a good day look like for you and how do we make that happen for you i'd like to echo what both of the speakers have already said um, and i'd like to add the financial planning that you do for yourself assuming you do any financial planning um, you have to do this as a plan Go and find resources. The number one issue I have seen with the caregivers we've supported, they had no documentation. And if you have no documentation that gives you the legal rights to do the things you need to have done, you're up a creek without a paddle. And there are free services through legal aid groups and you can find who those are through your uh, area of aging organizations. And get the paperwork right, I can't emphasize. Paperwork that allows you to provide the support and services that they need. You also need to have conversations to know if you're, uh, if you're planning for me, I hope you, I hope you are, if you, but if you're planning for me, I want you also to know who I am. Who is Paula? What would she want? Would she want to be placed in a nursing home? Does she want to be placed on a ventilator? Does she want you to change your life so much that she would be unhappy? You need to know the loved one so you know my, my needs and desires. That way, when you're caring for me, if I'm no longer able to make decisions myself, that you make sure that you're doing the things you know I want. I want you also to honor me as long as possible. Allow me to be independent as long as possible. Don't let me hurt myself, but don't take things away from me that I can still do. I believe in honoring the loved one and ensuring that they do what they can. You can get support through as the area of agencies. There's lots of groups out there that provide you with support. Get the help, start asking the questions, which I'm excited that you're asking the questions at this point. Here's a semi-related question, um, also going right to the issue of trying to help uh, provide care for a family and loved one. How does one stay on top of what is going on with the loved one's caregiving from long distance? So long distance caregiving has its own unique set of challenges and it's often its um, unique um, sets of guilt, you know, about not being present. And I, I just encourage folks to set that aside. So uh, the value that you can bring to a caregiving situation from a distance can be incredible. And um, the power of caring uh, reaches across the mile. So um, in terms of um, uh, tangibly what you can do is make sure that you have a good connection, a good relationship with the people providing care. So um, make sure that you're engaged in care planning conferences. As uh, Paula talked about, make sure you know the, the person who's being cared for. What is it that's important to them? What are their aims? And if you hear that the care is, is going down a different path, don't be shy about um, being that voice. Uh, we're all connected right here, right now, and not in person. So we can be impactful in terms of in being from being a, a, from a distance. So make sure that you're connected to the organization or the service providers. Make sure that you have regular touch bases. Make sure that the care recipient, if they're able to, has a voice in this, that you're communicating with them as well about care. And their goals may change. Stay in tune to that. Make sure that um, you're, you're a part of that care team and viewed as such, not just by the home care providers, but by the medical team as well. Um, your, your voice is important there. And um, I really value the question. And I can't state enough how valuable those long distance caregivers are. And many times it's families. There might be someone on site who's 
the on hand, hands on care partner, and then there might be kids in other parts of the state it's, or country, really important to be a part of that team and know that that's a value as well. And let me echo everything that Christine said and add to it that also know who lives near your family. Mm -hmm. Your loved one lives in a community and there may be some neighbors that can help out from time to time. So know who's around them, create a care team, not just of physicians and, and nurses and doctors, but of neighbors, of friends, of people who can help you out day to day. Because those folks you can call in the middle of the night that I just got a call from my mother, there's a key underneath the mat, would you please go check on her? Mm -hmm. Or things like that, so very practical kinds of things. Also understand what you can and cannot do. One of the challenges of long distance care is you think you can do everything and most of the time you cannot do everything. So know what you can. And if you have family members that are part of this conversation and I, I, I'm excited if you do, I had crazy family, so my stuff never got connected. Um, so it's one of those situations, if you have family that you can connect to, talk about roles and responsibilities. Who's going to do what? Who's gonna support them how? And make commitments to each other and ensure that the loved one is the most important thing in this conversation. And I think we're getting pretty close to being out of time. I don't know if we have time for any more questions. I think we probably have time for one more quick question before we close out today to be respectful of everyone's time. Okay. I do have one more. This is, uh, I think Claire, you, you already talked about this, but I'm gonna throw this one at you. Um, this is someone asking, can Michigan create a credential for direct care workers like that in the state of Washington in order to require certain training and a professional designation? And maybe the follow-up to that would be, how would it do that? Yeah, absolutely. And that is really an important thing to do. Washington State is a little unique, and they've been able to do that. Uh, they have a very strong and positive relationship with the SEIU union. And um, so our political situation is a little bit different here in Michigan, but we are working hard to at the, the state initiatives that I mentioned that I could not be more hopeful and more proud of Michigan for putting together these state leader, state leaders really, who are now working together. And one of the things that we're doing is um, pushing for a statewide direct care worker training infrastructure, which would include a training arm and a credentialing arm. And that can be done either from within state government or outside of state government. Um, but we have submitted a proposal to MDHHS for this, and hopefully to be able to use some of the ARPA, the Biden ARPA funds for it. But regardless, we have to figure out a way to have a statewide credentialing program. And We've been um, in active discussion about how to do that, and I'm very hopeful. Well, thank you. Can I do a shameless a plug before you close? I'm doing a lunch and learn on Thursday. Check my website out, it's free. And it's called The Power of Hope because it is so important that our caregivers not give up. We need you. I mean, we need you badly. And I celebrate you every time I can. So sorry, plug, plug. it's on my website and it's free. I'm going to throw in a plug too. Um, back to the credentialing thing. And Paula, I wish I'd had you several years ago. I was a family caregiver for my father. And, you know, I've been in this uh, business 40 years and I never recognized myself as a family caregiver. You know, he was just my dad. Um, but I... Um, on uh, December 1st at 1030, there is a um, uh, state, uh, it's the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Health and Human Services, and five of us are going to be talking, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about is this proposal for training and credentialing um, program. So if you can 
either stream in, it's uh, being organized by Representative Whiteford, and we can get information to you if you're interested. But it, the more people who are on board with this, you know, a lot of this involves systems changes at the state level, and that requires advocacy and allies to work with legislators, all of us working together. There's power in numbers and there's power in relationships. So I encourage you to get involved with some of these advocacy issues, and that would be a great place to start. All right, well, thank you so much, guys, for coming. Um, I want to special thanks to Christine, you know, special thanks to Claire, Paula, and Ted. I want to thank you to our readers and our viewers. Thank you for joining the discussion today. It was very deep and thoughtful, and I really took some things away from that today. As a reminder, the recording will be posted on our Bridge Michigan website tomorrow. Um, the, feel free to share that post with anyone who you think needs it um, or some people who you think may have missed the discussion. If you want to stay up to date with our upcoming Bridge events, you can subscribe to our free newsletter at bridgemi.com. Again, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank our readers. I want to thank our panelists for the just the thoughtful and insightful presentation. And I will see you all soon. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thanks.